Hi everyone, I'm Apostle T.B. Walker. I want to welcome you once again to Disciples of Faith Global Outreach where we are reaching the world one chair at a time. So glad to have you with us. We've got a lot of things to talk about today. We've got quite a few things to discuss. Uh, we're just going to deal with one verse here today. But we've got a few things that we've got to look at because there's a lot of meat on the bones today. I'm excited to have you here. We're going to get directly into the word. I'm going to, I want to also encourage you to share the video. So, you know, as you are going throughout your day uh, and you're being blessed by what God has given you, we want to make sure we, we offer this as a gift to each and every one of your friends. Go ahead and uh, hit the share button. And we just thank God for you. And for those that are starting a watch party, we thank God for you as well. Let's get directly into the word. I'm just going to read one verse today. It's going to be coming out of the book of Revelations, uh, Revelation chapter number two, starting at verse number 17, ending at verse number 17. We're going to have a word of prayer. Then we're going to dive directly into the word. All right, let's, let's get directly into it. How you doing, mom? All right, let's look at it. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give him some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. That's the word. Now, so in, in taking a look at this, the scripture says to us, it says, um, whoever has ears, let him hear what the spirit is actually saying to the churches. Now, we, we know that we're dealing here with the church at Pergamos. We're dealing with this church that the Lord has actually said, I know the environment that you're actually in right now. I know exactly where you are. Matter of fact, he calls it Satan's seat. So we know that there is a that there is a spirit of Satan behind the government that is in Pergamos. One of the things that we know is not only is there a spirit of evil behind the government, but that Satan is in a legal place in that particular city, that, that the people want him there. They want his spirit there. He doesn't have to knock down any doors. He, he, they're already under grand delusion. They're already under great deception. So one of the things that we find out here, which is really, really easy, is that uh, these very same people are in a place where they are inviting Satan in. They, they've literally made the invitation. He's accepted, and his government is behind the physical government that is running the city. That, that's really important because we got to understand that when the scripture tells us that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against these principalities, the, the, it's really talking about governments. The reality is that the Lord, that the, the spirit uh, has actually spoken through Paul to say, our wrestling match here is actually the spirits behind the physical manifestations, that their government, their, their, their principalities, their rulers that are in the atmosphere that are also behind the rulers that we see now. One of the reasons why we need to pray for those who have rule over us is because we recognize that they are under continuous satanic attack. If Satan is able to direct the governments of this world, if he's able to control human government, then rights are absolutely in that very same place of being controlled. So I want you to look at this. The scripture talks about the fact that, listen, I know where you are. I know that you're in, you're in Satan's seat. I know the atmosphere that you're ministering in. I know that all the, the adversity that's surrounding you. I know the types of people that are coming against you. And you've held on to my name. You, you've kept the faith. You have not denied my faith. That's what he actually said. But he talks to this church about some of the things that he has against them. And there's great compromise that's going on in the church. It is not just those that are actually actively involved in the compromise, but it's also those that are the silent participants in the compromise. Those that saw it, but said nothing. Those that thought that they were abstaining and that they were somehow absolved from any of the, the, the criminality of the action did not recognize that they were complicit. That the Lord was saying, well, listen, you're a part of it. It's almost like you're a part of the conspiracy because I want you to recognize that by saying nothing and doing nothing, there's blood that's still in your hand. The scripture tells us that when we see our brother caught in sin, he says, if you say nothing, not only will that brother die. Now, that is not, he, he's not saying, well, listen, you killed him. He's saying, listen, he's going to die from the ailment that you saw. But he says, 
I am going to require that blood. I, that, that blood is actually on your hand. In other words, though you didn't kill him, you are part of the killing process because you abdicated your position as a healer. You didn't expose the sin. You may not be able to remove the sin, but you didn't even lead them to a physician who could have helped them out of that sinful condition. So the Lord is actually saying, listen, I know what's going on there. But now looking at this, he's actually talking about, you know, when, when he talks about repent, he talks about the fact that they need to, to turn. That's one of the things that he, that he actually mentions. And he says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Now, this is important because when you really understand this, the danger of false teaching is still here today. The, the danger of immoral contact, conduct in the house of God, among the people of God, is still running rampant and is dangerous today. False doctrine is dangerous. Now, you know, here's the thing. Most of us, when we look at the idea of something running rampant in the church, the problem is we're still looking at that building with that particular address. We don't recognize that things are running rampant in the church when they're running rampant in your house because you make up the church. When any part of the body is sick, the church is sick. And so it's sick, not because the building is messed up. It's sick, not because, well, they've got their organization that's messed up. They're sick because the people are sick and the people are sick for a variety of reasons. Some of the people are sick because they're taking the wrong substances, right? And that substances is false doctrine. That substances is what the Nicolaitans are talking about. Though those substances are exactly what the, the doctrine of Balaam is actually all about, where he enticed immorality, enticed the children of Israel to sin against God, to bring curses upon themselves. What a sickness. But then there's another sickness where he's talking about those spectators that actually saw the sickness but had no part and thought that they weren't getting sick themselves. Do you understand that when you see your brother, he's going to shed blood. But do you understand that the Lord says, look at your hands. There's blood on you too. Th that sin has manifested itself in the person who's doing it and in the person who did nothing about it. So when you begin to look at this, he says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the spirit is saying to the churches. Now, this is really important because this is an invitation that, the, that Jesus actually gave doing his earthly ministry, right? Where he says, he that has an ear, let him hear. Now, he doesn't say to the churches, but he says, he that has an ear, let him hear. Now, there's revelation that's in this because when you understand what he's actually talking about, this is not just about the audible hearing, but this is about heeding. This is about obeying, right? This is about acceptance. So if I heed and I accept and I obey, then, I can, then I'm actually one of those people who has an ear to actually hear. Now, there are people who take it in. There are people who actually heed it, but they never accept it, but, and they obey. And I need you to understand something. The requirement is that you heed it and that you accept it and that you obey. Why? Because that is only temporary. When you are in a place of doing the right thing for the wrong reasons, when your heart is not in it, do you understand your worship and your actions are in a absolutely temporary spot, that you're in a place where you cannot endure. The Bible says that that person that endures to the end, that's the one that shall be saved. So when you look at this, you've got to understand it's not your sprint. It's not the fact that I did it. It's not the fact that we hugged each other. It's not the fact that I shook your hand. The Lord is talking about people who get their mind and their heart behind his will. There's a point where you can no longer oh, do what God said, but don't agree with it in your spirit. The, the, you know, I don't agree with it, but I'm going to do it anyhow. That's, that's temporary. That person is not durable in any way. James said, but be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. He says, only deceiving yourself. He says that those people that hear the word, but don't do the word are deceiving themselves. Why? Because you think the power is in the hearing alone. You think the power is in being in the service alone. I was online that day. I'm sitting there listening to Apostle Walker right now. That's not the power. The power is when I'm stopped, is when you stop, when you shut this down. The question is going to be, 
Did you get it in and are you trying to get it out? See, in the end of the day, when you understand the word that, that if you just get it in and don't get it out, you have not fulfilled the purpose of you receiving it in the first place. The reason you receive it is to bear fruit. The seed goes in, the fruit goes out. And if there is only the ingesting of the seed, but no production of the fruit, then we got to question the tree and we got to question what you did with the seed. The seed is never wrong. The seed is never the problem. The ground is the issue. So the Lord says, listen, he that has an ear, let him hear. Check your ground. I want you to check where you are. I want to check whether you got a whole bunch of notes, but but a life that looks like this. You got a whole bunch of revelation in, in, in your phone. You got a whole bunch of revelation in your pad, on your laptop, but your life, the miracles that have been that have been formed through you are like this. The healing, the the, the healing ministry that, that you've been writing about, that you've lived only this amount of it. You haven't prayed for a headache. So the reality is you got to understand, do you really have an ear? Check yourself. Then the Lord recognized. He said, listen, I know I, I'm, I'm speaking to the whole congregation, but I'm only ministering to a remnant. He that has an ear, let him hear. I know all y'all didn't even come in here for the right reason. I know you're all y'all not looking here to be better. You didn't come in here for change and transformation. There are people that came in here and said, I got nothing else to do. I'm just scrolling down. But those that are tapped in right now and realize that, God, this is an appointment with me. You are trying to turn up my dull hearing. Now, listen, I need you to understand something. This is not for people who think that their hearing is sharp. This is The only reason you're here is that God is saying, your hearing is a little dull. Turn it up. I'm saying something that you may not be receiving yet. But my goal of getting you here this afternoon is that you will get it. Those that have an ear, let them hear what the Spirit is actually saying to the churches. Now, now listen, not to just your church, not to some denomination. The Lord is saying this to every one of the churches. He says to him who overcome. Now, let's, check, let's, let's stop here because I need you to understand something. There's a promise that God has for those that overcome. And I need you to understand something, that the overcomer endures in his faith. Now, I want you to get that. That they endure in the faith, that in spite of all the trials and the hardships that are coming their way, note that the spirit never speaks and says, I'm coming and I'm going to stop anything. No, it says the person who overcomes, the person who is successful in their resistance to the power of culture, that person who is successful in their resistance to the powers that are around them, to the powers of flesh, to all the temptations of the world, it says that that person, that, that God has a reward for them, that person who overcomes, that person who was able to hold on. He says, you're good right now. And I need you to understand that. When, at this very writing to you, you, you've held on to my name, but you can't stop because another attack is about to come. Another attack is about to come from within. Do you understand what he says? That he that has an ear, let him hear. He's making a separation immediately. He's doing the separating. He's now saying, well, listen, when you come out of that funk, when you get your thing together, when you decide what you're going to do, I need you to understand there are people around you that are not going to like it. I need you to understand there are people in your atmosphere that are not going to like it. But if you can hold on to the end, I'm not talking about running well. I'm talking about holding on to the end. Now, get this. This is a demonstration that's not about being a gladiator. It's about people who know how to depend on God. This is for people who may not be the smartest in the bunch, you know, who may not even be the toughest in the bunch. There are people who recognize right now, like, man, I hate pain. I would, I would hate for me to be in a position of pain. But in the end of the day, why could God trust that person with pain? Because they know how to depend on God. They don't know how to take pain, but they know how to trust God to get them through pain. See, there's a whole different thing when you recognize your weakness. The stronger you get, the weaker you recognize you are and you recognize your strength was never in your weakness in the first place. His strength is made perfect in your weakness. People who are told that they can, who know that they can, know that they can only through Christ. That there's some people whose resume is only, I can do all things through Christ. I failed at so many other things, but in Jesus, 
I recognize he's made me a dynamo that I was not born into, that he's made me tougher and stronger and wiser than I ever expected to be. Let me read something to you because this is for people who are made up in their mind. I'm going through with Jesus through thick and thin. This is 1 John chapter 5 and it starts at verses 4 through 5. And I want you to, I want, I want you to get this. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Now, I want you to get that. Who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the son of God. Listen, you need to grab that because the Lord is saying, listen, I need you to understand you have in you precious faith. There's a reason why it's precious. It's a gift from God, but it has power in it to overcome the world. The, the scripture here says, Whoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And then he says, well, who is that one? Well, that one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Well, listen, the moment you hear that, the moment you grab that, you got to know immediately the enemy is after that revelation and that revelation alone. The enemy is not after church. The enemy is not after temples and mosques or synagogues. The enemy is after that revelation alone. And if you are willing to part with that revelation right there, that's it in a nutshell. The moment you get a believer who says, you know, Christianity is my path. But, but there may be another path. You are off base already. You might need to check your own faith because if you think there is another way, you are operating counter to the word that says that I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father, but no man, there's no way to get there but by me. That's what the scripture says. So I need you to understand this. Trials are hard and they are real and they come to try your faith. And, and listen, with trying your faith is not only trying your faith to see whether it is evident, but the Lord is trying your faith to prove its durability. Listen, we're not selling candy here. You know, this is not about cakes and pies. This is about tires and steel. And when you look at hard things, when you look at who you are really made to be, steel is sold based upon its durability. How much can it be strength? What's it going to take to bend it? And listen, when you understand that it takes this amount of strength to bend this steel, you look and say, well, I don't have anything that's going to bend that. I need that steel. How long, uh, how good are these tires? They can take 25,000 miles. You can get 100,000 miles in these tires. That means that they can be whooped on the road 100,000 miles and they'll still keep on rolling. So when you understand who you are, if you are a Twinkie Christian, then listen, this ain't for you. I, my suggestion is that you get with somebody on the real side so you can get transformed. Listen, if you're about cakes and, and about candy and you think this thing is sweet, you listen, you on the wrong side. Thank God you've been born up to this point in America because for those that are in America, yeah, but for anyone who's listening outside of this, you will know that this is not sweet like that. This is not for the for the cake believer. This is for one that is the steel believer, the one that has a, a faith of iron. And the Bible says iron sharpens iron. So there's a reason where God is saying, I'm identifying you already. He said, listen, that person who overcomes, I'm going to give him the hidden manna. Now, I want you to get this, because this is really, this is revelation for us as well. You know, when we understand this hidden manna, this is God saying, I'm going to give you my true provision, right? Now, not only my true provision, but I'm going to give you my true provision from heaven, right? So when you look at this, the, the overcomer, that the per people in Pergamos had already refused to eat food off of the idols. Well, God said, I got some food for you. Now, let's look at this manna, because I want you to understand that this manna is a symbolic picture of Jesus Christ. That, that's who is being promised here. Now, you know, as as uh, when Moses was going through the wilderness, manna was provided from heaven by God that sustained the Israelites 40 years in the desert while they were wandering. 40 years of struggle, 40 years of, uh, of, of, of being destitute in some areas, hungry in many other areas, thirsty in many other areas, lost and strangers wherever they went, yet God provided this manna that, that he brought from heaven to sustain them. Well, Jesus now comes and says, well, the same way that they were strengthened from heaven by manna, if you overcome, I'm going to give you what he calls 
is its hidden manna. Now, listen, this, this is amazing because it is spiritual durability to maintain through this whole walk. Now, you know what? I mean, when you look at it, the miracle is not just that they made it, but they didn't get consumed in the process. That, that even through that whole process, God was able to get a Moses and a Joshua and a Caleb out of the whole bunch. When you look at that, they could have died. So Jesus is now saying, I'm the spiritual sustenance that you need to get you through this. And it's promised to you. And so Jesus himself, let me tell you what Jesus said. Because he made the same connection. He says, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now, listen, this manna sustained, that, that was sustaining the Israelites as they were going through the desert was a foreshadowing of Jesus. It was a foreshadowing of what he was going to do. You know, it, and so it's a symbol, though. So when he talks about this hidden manna, he's talking about this symbolically. And, but, but even though it's symbolic, it is also very real and symbolic all at the same time. Because it is not, it is symbolic in that it is actually not food. It is real in, in that it is food not eaten in the same way you eat manna. That when you eat manna, you have to digest it. When you, when you are receiving this word, you ingest it and digest it in a completely different way. He's simply saying, you're not going to eat this because remember, when they ate manna, they died. I'm placing this in a position where it cannot die. In other words... I'm going to sustain you, not only through your trial, but even through eternity. Listen, I want you to get that. This is, this is the promise that he, get, that he gives. And listen, this is exclusive. He said, listen, if you overcome, I'm going to give you the hidden manna. Listen, there's something. God reigns on the just as well as the unjust, but there's something special about the just. He said, listen, for you, I've been setting something aside just for you. It, it, it's hidden. And it's, it's a reward. And it's hidden because the world has rejected it. The world hasn't seen it. And it's given exclusively to the believers. Listen, faith comes by hearing. So those that have an ear are the only ones that will be able to receive faith. And therefore, by having faith that God says he will preserve with this hidden manna. Do you under, understand this is only for the believer? Now, now get this. God giving this manna, you understand the story is that starvation can make you quit. When you don't have any more strength, you can feel like giving up. But when you understand that God is saying, I'm going to be the one who's going to feed you even when you feel like there's nothing left. I'm going to be the one that's going to feed you when you feel like you have nothing else. And when you feel like you fail, I'm going to be doing the work through you, whether your flesh is in agreement or not. The unbelieving world has already rejected Christ, so they'll never know this joy. And listen, the Lord says, not only will I give you this manna, but I'm going to give you a white stone. Now, White stones in the Roman Empire, you know, and during the Roman times meant lots of things. It could mean an invitation uh, to, to a, a party or a banquet. You know, it could be a sign of friendship. It was often used as a sign of acceptance that you had voted or that you had done some, almost like a stamp, a certificate. But it was also a, a sign of acquittal as well. And when you begin to look at, you know, and that's in a court of law. Now, when you look at the time of the writing in Revelations here, the white stone was the equivalent of innocence, right? That's exactly what, what it says. So when you begin to look at here, you were tried for some uh, crime and the judge gave you a white stone, you were acquitted. If you were given a black stone, then you were considered guilty. So to receive a white stone means that you are free now of condemnation. What's the Lord said? Uh, for th those that are in Christ, there is therefore no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. In other words, you've been tried, you've been tried and found worthy. I, I, I want you to get this. Th this is through the trial. So the white stone, and I want you, this is major. The white stone is a symbol of who you actually have become 
through your trial. The white stone is not who you were. The white stone is a symbol of transformation. And listen, I want you to get this. The white stone is not white by color because it doesn't deal with it in terms of color. It is translucent and it is shiny and it is glimmering in such a way that you can actually see yourself. Self. So when you understand, you don't even understand the, 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 when the Lord said, listen, let, let, let this patience have its perfect work. What perfect work? Th this is just breaking me down. This is just tearing me up. When you get to see this white stone and you look at who you have become through your own determination to overcome sin, you become a ruler over your own self. Listen, the same way this stone is a symbol. This is a symbol of the rock solid purity that you walk in now. That, that's exactly what it is. I mean, literally here on earth, you are being tested and tried, but here in heaven, the Lord says, you'll be proven. I'm going to manifest it in front of everybody. Listen, I'm talking about the days you didn't know whether you were really there. The fact that you withstood the testing, I'm going to give you this new stone. And the stone is going to have a name written on it that this hard faith, this hardcore purity, this hardcore sanctification that is as solid as a rock that could not be broken by any of the trials and tribulations of this earth is going to have a new name written on it. This new name is going to be an expression of your new character. It's going to be expression of your new life. It's going to be expression of the new level that you've ascended to. It's a step in a, in a direction that you've been trying to go in. And the Bible says, and, and I'm going to give you a name. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a white stone and, and I'm going to write on that stone a name. Right. And, and it's a new name. So we know that. But it says, which no one knows except him who receives it. Now, I want you to get this. He said it's, it's going to be a new name. And I want you to note that there's never a place in this new name where anybody has to teach you of the name. There's no way. Listen, you will know. See, listen, when you get to him, the truth is we're not like we are now. You will know and you will know him and you will know him in the way that you don't know him now. You will know him in a perfection. You will know him in a completeness and you will understand you in a way you've never known. And note that when he gives you this new name and when he gives you a stone with that name written on it, a stone that no one, it says, no one knows except him who receives it. Now, how in the world am I named Johnny and he gives me a new name and never tells me the name and just writes it on the stone and yet somehow I instantly know that name? Listen, you are keenly aware of the battles that you fought to get you where you are. You Listen, we don't brag about them right now because we're too busy fighting. We, listen, we, we, we don't have time to, to, to saber rattle right now because we got to really get down to it. We don't have time sometimes to remember all the things that, that we've actually overcome. We're just too busy overcoming them because we go from faith to faith and glory to glory. The minute one giant is knocked down, there's another one that pops right up. So you don't even know your exploits. But do you understand that the Lord, I mean, let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit who remembers everything writes down everything. And when you see that name, when you see that stone with that name, you will instantly remember every battle that you've been in and won. Even the battles you thought you lost and then you look back on. You listen, when David was old, he says, I was young, but now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Amazingly, when I was 21, I thought that they were. But now that I'm 71, they, you know, I recognize now that they had never been forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. When you understand the battles and when you understand the identity, the warrior that God has been calling you all your life, for the first time in your life for real, you begin to identify with the way he's seen you. When you begin to look at this, it's the ultimate symbol of your transformation. It's the ultimate symbol of your change. This new, listen, this new name that only you and God know are the testimony of your spirit. Listen, let me tell you something right now. 
The name has been spoken. Your spirit is speaking it right now. You just don't hear it. You know, and the Lord has been seeing you and calling you by that name. Isn't it amazing that, that the Lord saw Gideon as a mighty man of valor, but when he met him, he was in a cowardice hiding position, and the Lord did not call him Gideon. He called him mighty man of valor. Isn't it amazing how God will come and give you a new name? And the crazy thing about it is not new in heaven. It's just new to you. You're the only, you're the only one calling yourself a wimp when the Lord is calling you a warrior. You're the only one to say I can't when the Lord is saying, but you said that like 10 years ago and you've been still going on. You're the only one that's calling yourself a quitter when you're still on the line, still praying, still fasting, still holding on. It's you that's calling yourself weak. It's you that's telling you that you're unable. Those aren't words that he's using. He's using words like more than a conqueror. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. He's saying, let the weak declare that I'm strong. But you know what? We don't always do that over here. But over there, the Lord says, you don't have to say it. I'm going to say it. The testimony of your spirit has been saying it. This is how I see you. You know, the amazing thing that the Lord says, I will not see you by your old nature. I'm going to see you by your new nature. I'm, I'm not going to see you by your human nature. I'm going to see you by the new creation that's in you. Listen, the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, He's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Many of us have not received this newness. And it's going to be hard for you to really, really get with the program if you don't really see the newness that's in you. You won't see it in the fullness. I get that. That's the reason why it's a new name. And it's a reason why it's going to be something that might be surprising for a moment to us, but yet we'll fall right into it and receive it and know it. And listen, he says, you'll know then what you don't know now, but there's some things you can know right now. He'll never leave you or forsake you. There, there's this name you will not know then, what, what, you know, until then, but there's a name that's above every name that you can know now, and that name is Jesus. And I want you to look at this. This name that you're going to receive is a name through all eternity. You know, and, and when, when you get that name, there's no more battles. You know, there's no more sin to overcome. There's no more of the struggle that's there. That name is eternal, eternity. But you know what? Here's the amazing thing about this. And I'm going to close out here. And, and my hope is that you get this because I don't want to be here long today. But I want you to really, really grab hold of this. Even with a brand new name. Whatever that name is and whatever the new name that I'm going to receive and whatever the new name my mother is going to receive and my children, my wife, every my friends, whatever the new name everybody's going to receive. Do you understand that even in heaven, there'll be a name that we'll all be speaking? That we even knew before this name. And that's the name of Jesus. Before I get my name, I had a name that I knew and leaned on and recognized that it was salvation unto me. And that's the name of Jesus Christ. That's why we're here today. So I want you to begin to look at this word and I want you to take seriously what's really spoken and what's really there. That the reality of the, the promise that's there, but the reality of the overcoming that has to be done before the name. Listen, before we stand in the winner's circle, we need to win. And in order to win, we just need to stand. Because the reality is the Bible says, who is he that's already overcome the world? But it started out with God has already overcome the world. The victory is there. So the battle is not mine. The victory is. He said, if you can overcome you. Listen, I want you to get this because this is important. And I'm going to stop here. But I want you to get this. This is not about demons. This is not about imps. I want you to get that. This is not about casting down and, and seeing sorcerers everywhere. This is not about you know, destroying warlocks in any way, shape, or form. This is not about sorcery. This is not about Ouija boards. This is not about any of that. Listen, you know who you have to overcome? You have to overcome you. You know, the person who's talking you out of being who God has called you to be is you. Listen, it, it, mama's not there. Daddy's not there. Whatever happened, happened 25 years ago. But the reason why you're still on your knees instead of standing on your feet is because you have decided to be where you are. And I want you to understand, this is for those that have overcome even themselves. you got to overcome you. The battle is in you. Listen, before you go out and decide that you're not going to speak Jesus, you had to say that to you. There's no devils around you that are saying, you better not say it. It's that, it's you, it's flesh. 
And when you overcome you, when you decide I'm going to beat myself up half the day and then after this I'm going to walk victorious. Listen, let me tell you who dragged you down today. That's you. Because the world has been overcome already. Satan has been defeated already. Now you have got to wrangle down every thought, every high thing that would dare exalt itself against the knowledge of God. So listen, it's important today and I want you to receive it today. So I'm going to pray today that you receive this word, that you get this in your spirit, that God is really stirring up the soldiers. He's really making sure that those that are in the nest that are, you know, kind of chilling and laying back in the roost are now being stirred up. And those that thought that maybe it's me and maybe you're calling me are being stirred up. And those that knew it and know it, but for whatever reason were fearful are being stirred up. And for those that thought that they were on the sidelines, marginalized, you know, maybe my time is over. Listen, God is stirring you up. The army is being called to the forefront to make a stand. And if the enemy sees us standing, I want you to understand, he'll flee. Resist the devil and he'll flee. We just have to stand. The enemy is only chasing you because you're running. See, I want you to grab that. He's only chasing you because you're running. Listen, you want to know how you get a wolf? You have to stare down a wolf. You got to stand down a wolf. Now, there are other animals that are different, but a wolf... Is different. And we're coming against wolves in sheep's clothing. And when a wolf confronts you, if it's a pack of wolves, the one thing that anybody will tell you is to stare a wolf down. Do not turn. Do not run away. Do not even avert your gaze. Look directly at a wolf. Listen, when the Lord says stand, he's not saying they're not going to charge you. He's saying, you know how to whoop a wolf? Then act like it. Stand in his face and decide I'm going nowhere. And if we've got to fight, then we've got to fight, but I'm not running because I don't have anything guarding my back. Everything in Ephesians 6 with the full armor of God only guards my front. It's only for warriors who came in here to win. So I'm going to be praying today that you uh, want to win. I don't want to talk about losing. I don't want to talk. I don't want to talk to losers today. So listen, I'm only talking to winners today. I hope that that's you. I'm only talking to those that know they're walking in victory and that the world has already been overcome. If you're trying to overcome the world, listen, maybe you need to be somewhere else because the Bible I'm reading is actually saying it's already been overcome. So this is for victory. This is for those that are victors and not victims. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we just thank you right now for your people. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you even right now for fire that's coming down from heaven. We thank you even right now for the fire that's not, not burning up uh, priests as it did in, in, in the days of Elijah. But God, we thank you right now for the fire that's coming down from heaven that is consuming fear, that's consuming doubt, that's hindering creativity. God, we just thank you right now for the fire that's destroying any procrastination, low self-esteem and doubt that's been placed in us by the enemy and even by situations and circumstances that are affecting your people. But God, I just thank you right now that as you're giving us this message, God, that you're causing us to go forward, that you're causing us to go forward and to stand and to take another step and to stand. And you've already said that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. It may kill the body, but it cannot kill the spirit. So God, we just thank you right now for your spirit. We thank you right now for victory. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Listen, my prayer is that you were blessed today by this word. My prayer is that we'll, we'll, you'll, it will impact you, but that you will ingest it, that you will take it in and that make it a part of your lifestyle. Listen, that's the most important thing. The goal here isn't that you, that part of your lifestyle is that you're here every Sunday at 12 o'clock. You're here every Thursday at 7.30, that you're on our website at disciplesoffaith.life. That, that's, that's not the actual goal. And, and that ingesting it means that this is my lifestyle because then we share the mission. You aren't the mission. We begin to share the mission. Part of this, my mission is to teach, but my mission is also to begin to see you grow so that you can begin to duplicate the very thing that's been given to you that you'll be able to give to other people. So listen, this is the, the end of, of our service today and, and our, all of our information on how you can sow into this ministry is given to you. Listen, if you want to see uh, how you can be a greater part of our ministry, I want you to go to disciplesoffaith.life and you can see it. There's a lot of the outreach that we can't do right now, but we're going to still need ministers who will pray. We still need authors who are willing to write uh, to reach the world through through the literacy uh, programs that we have and through the literature that we give out. And also, we really just need people who are continually praying for the ministry that, that every hindrance that will come against it 
is going to be brought down. We're in a very, very serious time, and but God's got some very, very serious people that are already prepared to overcome. And listen, if this ministry and this word has been a blessing to you, listen, we thank you for every seed that you sow into this ministry for the support that you give. We need your prayers. We need your strength. But I want you to live this life. God bless you and have an awesome Sunday.